Hi, I'm Evelyn Glennie, and my mission is to teach the world to listen. And you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Hi, Christopher here from Musical U, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today on the show, I'm joined by Evelyn Glennie, the world's first full time solo percussionist. Her mission in life is to teach the world to listen, and her TED talk, entitled How to Truly Listen, has been viewed almost 5 million times. If that wasn't remarkable enough, take a peek at the description or the presenter bio for that TED talk, and you'll discover that Evelyn actually lost almost all her hearing at the age of 12. One might assume that a deaf musician must just be playing from memory or straight from instructions, which would make it a strong example of the kind of robotic playing we often talk about getting away from on this show. But Evelyn actually represents the polar opposite. Her deep focus on listening and feeling each and every note makes her a prime example of just the kind of truly intentional, expressive playing that we celebrate and seek to encourage here at Musical U. Evelyn has given deep and careful thought to the topic of listening and sound and music and how our relationship with each of these can transform our lives and the lives of those around us. From her TED Talk, to provocative sound art installations, to YouTube teaching videos, and of course her professional performing career, Evelyn's work just sparks of passion and creativity and wisdom. So to say I was eager to pick her brains about musicality and the listening skills of music would be a huge understatement. In this conversation, we talk about the remarkable way her first percussion teacher introduced her to the instrument and helped her connect intimately and instinctively with all that it could do. We talk about how thinking of your performance as a sound meal can be the gateway to providing a more compelling experience for your audience, and why musicians who get very good at musical listening in the specific concrete practical ways can actually lose sight of a far more fundamental and important kind of listening. Like the best musical performances, I think Evelyn's comments in this interview will hold you wrapped as you listen, and then leave you with a lingering sense of wonder and curiosity to bring back to your own musical life. My name's Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Evelyn. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you have perhaps one of the most interesting musical origin stories as it were, that I've come across, and, and you shared it wonderfully in your TED Talk. But if any of our listeners haven't seen that amazing presentation, could you just tell us a bit about your own musical start, what it looked like for you to learn music? Well, first of all, I'm a farmer's daughter, so I spent my first 16 years on a farm. And that really was my orchestra, in a way, the, the sound world of the farm, the sound world of the countryside. And I think when you're in that type of environment, you very quickly learn about patience. And you're also trusted with sound. So you're um, connecting with livestock, you're connecting with machinery. Um, all of that has its own sound world. And when you're for a young person and you're given tasks to do on the farm, basically the sounds around you are sounds that you have to pay attention to, um, not just through the sounds that they create, but by the motion of that sound. So if you're seeing the wheels of a tractor move, you know, you're not necessarily picking up the sound first of all, but you're picking up that movement and that movement will generate the type of sound. So whether you need to back away or whether you, you need to go in a particular direction or whatever it might be. Um, so that actually had quite a bearing, I think, on my whole appreciation of sound. So it didn't really come from uh, learning music, first of all. It came from just paying attention to the environment that you're in. Um, and I think that really has allowed me to, I suppose, think about sound appreciation uh, first and foremost before thinking about musicality or indeed is sound appreciation music in itself. So that's, that's a question we can all ponder. A bit like, well, is noise music or is music noise? You know, what, what comes first really? 
Um, so, and I remember we had a piano in the house and it was more of an ornament than a, an instrument. And, but obviously the curiosity of a youngster, you know, went on the stool and started just sort of tapping away and banging away on the keys. Um, but I just loved the, the frequency range of the piano, the fact that, you know, you had very low sounds. And when you're a child, everything is quite exaggerated. So the low sounds were really low, you know, the high sounds were really high. And uh, the low sounds were big and fat. The high sounds were all tingly and star-like and, and, you know, sparkly and that kind of thing. So it was really, again, just creating whatever emotion happened to be inside of yourself. And when I turned eight years old, my parents decided that um, as I was picking up little themes, advert themes from the television, that was our medium, I suppose, that we had. We didn't have, uh, um, you know, record players or anything like that at that point. So, and I remember picking up little um, advert themes and believe it or not, my parents could actually recognize them after a while. So this was all done by ear. And they then decided that perhaps it's time to get some more formal education and have a, a piano teacher. So, and that's what happened. And, and I loved it. You know, I, I actually really enjoyed playing the piano. I went through all of the grades uh, on the piano. I enjoyed the process of just seeing the piano as a companion. Um, it was just something that I wanted to be with. I, I just felt that um, it was kind of a, a companion, a friend, um, just a way of expressing yourself. So there was never this feeling that, oh heavens, you had to plod through exercises and scales and, and you had to shut yourself in that room. That wasn't the kind of, um, environment really that that I was brought up with so I suppose again there was this sort of trust that my parents had that you know I will deal with the preparation in my way you know in my own time in in a kind of system or method or not that those are words that I really like to use but just in my own way and um I'm sorry but I to really, interrupt I, could I just ask, were your parents musical themselves? Did they have some experience or insight into what learning music could be like? Well, my father actually, believe it or not, had a very good ear, but he couldn't read music. And although he played the accordion in a dance band for weddings and things like that, he stopped when myself and my brothers were born. So we never actually saw him play at all. Um, and my mother, on the other hand, did not have a good ear, but she could read music. Okay. So she was of the type that had to kind of be pushed in there and, and, you know, made to do things. I was never really made to do anything. And that's just simply because I enjoyed doing it in the first place. And, uh, and I enjoyed the kind of curiosity of, of creating sound. I enjoyed the curiosity um, of feeding emotion through this instrument and always kind of almost seeing the instrument as an extension of your own body. And, uh, and that's why the, the kind of friendship thing came. You had this thing that was almost like a secretive thing to you, you know, um, but that's what happens when, when you're young. But anyway, um, I, and I also remember that I was never really very good at theory. And that was the side that I did have to sit down and really work at. That didn't feel as though it came naturally to me. So there was this very odd kind of balance going on between practically being absolutely wide open, but the theory I really struggled with, I really did. And of course, I needed that to get through the grades on the piano. So that I didn't enjoy, and I couldn't find a kind of um, soft, way to deal with theory. I couldn't find a way that um, that, that was enjoyable somehow. Um, it just seemed too strict. Everything, you know, had to add up to something. Whereas when you're just playing, nothing really had, has to add up to anything. It, it, it adds up to how you're feeling at the moment, you know. So even although you're reading something that's on the notated page, well, it, it is just a guide to actually how you're expressing it at that particular moment. But I remember when I reached the age of 12 and I was having real problems with my ears 
and I was looking for something to go alongside piano playing. And I kept piano going as a joint first study when I became a full-time student in London. And um, and so I was um, I put my name on the list to uh, try percussion when when I went to secondary school, and lots of people wanted to learn percussion. So I had to wait my time, and but once that time did come, I picked the sticks up, and it just literally felt an extension of my limbs. It just felt completely natural. And it's one of those things that, you know, why does someone learn the bassoon or the cello or the, the organ or sing or whatever? There's just something that is very hard to express whereby it just simply feels like the chemistry is right. And, uh, but I remember my teacher in the first lesson, he, you know, I was all gun ho at, you know, trying as many different things as possible. But he basically said, Evelyn, please take this drum away and I'll see you next week. And, uh, and of course, I was so perplexed at that and, and slightly disappointed, frankly, because it, I was really excited about this. So I walked home up to the farm with this drum. There were no sticks and no stand, just the drum. And I spent a week with this drum, not knowing at all what to do with it. But then, you know, bit by bit, I sort of struck the drum, I tapped the drum, I scraped the drum, I beat the drum, I tickled the drum, you know, I did all sorts of things. I turned it upside down on its side, whatever, whatever, and popped it on different surfaces. And, uh, and I found that actually, wherever I put this drum, it resonated quite differently. So if I put it on the grass, on, on the lawn, for example, at home, you know, it was quite dead. However, if I popped it on a on the kitchen table, the wooden table, it really resonated much more. Or if I popped a, a, a cushion over it, it would just be a, a, a very muffled kind of feeling. And um, and I remember the next week going back to my lesson and my teacher asked, how did you get on? And I said, well, I, I have no idea. I don't know what to do with this thing. And he knew I was a farmer's daughter. And he said, Evelyn, please create the feel of a tractor. And I thought, the feel of a tractor, well, I know what the feel of a tractor is, but there's a whole orchestra of tractors in my head. So is this tractor stationary with the engine off, in which case the feel is complete stillness? Or is it an old rickety tractor going up a hill? Is it a brand new spanking fancy tractor whereby the engine is just like a piece of velvet? You know, or what is this tractor? So is it in first gear? Is it in third gear? What, what's going on with this tractor? So I had then the permission to express this tractor through the drum in any kind of means possible, you know, using hands, feet, whatever I wanted to use. But it was my tractor and my expression of the tractor. And that had a huge bearing on basically how I progressed from, from there on in. It could have been a different environment if my teacher said, here are the sticks, please make sure you hold them at this angle, please make sure your arms are at this degree, please make sure your feet are this way apart or whatever it might be. And I would probably strike the drum, look at the teacher and ask for his permission if that was right or wrong. That did not happen. From the, the word go, this drum belonged to me. And therefore, what you express through that drum or any other tool that you have is your expression. It's your sound. And that's what makes the difference. So you're not asking for permission. Is it right or wrong? You're saying, this is my experience. So it's coming from the inside out rather than outside in. So rather than waiting for the teacher to say da 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 and you feed that into yourself and try and do it, what my teacher was, was asking me was, look, you explore what's inside of yourself and give that to me in a week's time. And that was the difference. It was just this different direction of, of giving. And that has allowed me really to, I suppose, sustain this curiosity 30 odd years later, 40 years later, in everything I, I do, because I still get excited by picking up a strange object and seeing what are the possibilities. It's like going back to that first lesson, you know, 
what that there's no rule book here it's just simply what is in your system that you want to explore and get out and maybe fall flat on your face and and you get up again and you see the, the other possibilities that's what really it's about that's fantastic there is so much there that i want to unpack um <laughs> but I'll, I'll start with the question that's front of mind for me which is was it just good fortune that you had a teacher who encouraged you in that way and let you lead an experiment or did he recognize that curious spirit in you or why, why was it that you didn't just arrive on lesson you know lesson one and start playing paradiddles or single stroke rolls or well i think it was a bit of everything i think it was the skill of the teacher and the the trust the teacher had in a young person's mind it's still elastic at that at that age and it's really respecting that and making sure that that is fed as much as possible and believed in and respected and listened to so he was quite remarkable in that way and also it was the environment that i was brought up in this is a country environment so we did not have you know percussion stores in in the nearest city we did not have music stores we did not have people coming in giving workshops and master classes and all of that sort of thing we did not have access to percussion repertoire or indeed percussion exercise books so we had very very little material as regards to things directed towards our instruments specifically, but because of that, we had so much more. We had the imagination. So the imagination had to think outside of the box. So basically, for example, we, um, on a snare drum, or on a tambourine, or on a pair of castanets, or on a triangle, or on a bass drum or something, we would play Bach partitas. So can you imagine the phrasing of a Bach partita? So if I go something like that kind of thing, whatever it might be, it, it could be anything. It could be a song. It could be a an aria. It could be a a, a a jig. It could be whatever. But if you plant that on a, a non-pitched instrument you're still thinking about the phrasing and with that phrasing you're not just thinking dynamically but you're thinking about sound color as well you're thinking about the sense of touch there you're thinking about so many different ingredients that go beyond the basic ingredients so you think about time and you think about rhythm and you think about playing the notes that's there and so on but actually you know all of these subtleties are more towards speaking through your instrument you know so when we speak i don't speak to you like this do i do i not do i don't you know whatever so that that would be absurd and in the same way that i wouldn't necessarily play that but i might play and with that you're suddenly changing how you stick something you know this the sticking that you use so rather than hand to hand you're actually expressing the feeling of what you want to get through so i suppose by having as i say less meant that we actually explored so many different other avenues in order to play our instruments and with that and i remember my teacher taking maybe a phrase from a piece of music. So again, it could be a bit of back. And he would say, right, let's make this more happy. What can we do to make this more happy? At the moment, it sounds maybe a little serious, or it might be, it's got a more masculine feel about it. How can we make this slightly lighter or more cheeky or a bit grittier or how can we make it more march like or whatever it, it, it could be so therefore we would think well does it need to be in another key so then aha what would happen if we tried it in a major as opposed to b major so b major is kind of beautifully and silky but a major is just a bit more string like would that work so this was dealing with transposition without 
thinking, oh, can you transpose this up or down at X, Y, or Z? But how can we make this more spring-like? Or how can we make this more snowy? Or how can we make, make this more dark or whatever? So it's, it's using those kind of terms through our, our music making and our discovery that I think was really important. But all of this was coming from piano repertoire, violin repertoire, flute pieces, and you name it. But at all of this at the same time, you know, the improvisation, the listening skill, the feeling, you know, how things felt like to play, exploring that sense of touch, which, which then it, it, that explores your sound colors and your dynamics and your, your trust in how you use your instrument as well. So you don't become hostage of, well, I must be seen playing it like this, or I, I must remember to do X, Y, or Z. It's just, I suppose, putting on a jumper or a coat and you're putting on your instrument. You know what I mean? You're, you're kind of making it fit for you. It's your body, it's your imagination, it's your length of arm, it's your size of hand, it's your stature and so on. And it, that's what the instrument has to fit, really, you know. And it is just like putting on a piece of clothing and thinking, aha, yep, this is, this is my instrument. This is how it fits for me. Wonderful. Well, I'm always really intrigued when I speak to someone such as yourself who has this, who, who highly values that emotional connection with the instrument and the value of creativity in learning and emphasizes that learning can be joyful, you know, it can be something you actually look forward to doing rather than are forced to do, but who has also reached the highest levels in terms of performance and I wonder, was there ever any conflict for you? you? I think that you maybe touched on it there when you talked about how transposition could be taught for a purpose rather than just for the sake of it. But I'm wondering, you know, there is a value in developing the instrument technique. Does that just happen, you know, by implication when you immerse yourself creatively like that? Or does it take a skillful teacher to kind of work in a syllabus, as it were, to all of this enjoyable learning? Did you ever have a clash between I want to be a very polished performer and I love this free exploration with the instrument? I think, yes, and I think we, we I do feel it's important to have the sense of curiosity and freedom, but also to have that support system as the teacher, whereby they, they are literally that, the support system and they can just you know guide here and there and and just sort of poke around here and there at, at the the needs for for that particular individual um it's when there's a uh and i i should also say that it is important um as a performing musician myself and as a professional musician to at times be under real stress to understand about stress and release, stress and release, stress and release. That's really important. So to know what it feels like to be nervous. And, you know, I get nervous before performances. Of course I do. But it's then how I use those nerves or how I recognize those nerves or how I own those nerves and see those nerves as just a natural progression of the performance. But, you know, I get nervous. And, but I know that there's going to be then the release factor. And I think health-wise, that's extremely important um, to, to have that balance. Um, and so that works for me. Um, but I do feel um, that it is important to, to you know, just have those moments where the, you're kind of out of your comfort zone, I suppose. Um, and because sometimes people think that, ah, oh, you're a musician, that must be fantastic. And, and oh, it must be such a great great life and, and everything. And yes, it is, of course it is, but we're not playing our instrument every single day in the way that we want to every single day. There are compromises if you're performing with other people and so on, or it could be the acoustics that you're in or the quality of the instruments that you're playing and so on. There are lots of different factors that happen all the time, actually, that, you know, you're always having to compromise in one way or another. However, the feeling of giving, 
giving the sound meal all of the time is something that overrides all of these other things. Um, in my own case, I mean, as a professional musician, I know that I'm in the music business, obviously, um, and I'm here talking with you and your viewers today. However, I haven't yet touched my instrument, so I haven't yet done any practice or playing or rehearsing or anything like that because I've been dealing with the actual business aspects. So, and that's a reality. Now, I'd love to forgo all of that and just, you know, play my days away, but that's not the, the reality of, of the, the kind of profession that you're in. Um, so I do think early on it's important to, to understand that it's not all roses. And even, you know, whether you're a professional or an amateur, to, to put yourself in these slightly more stressful situations, I think, is, is, is pretty crucial. You learn a lot. Mm, I love the way you framed that as, as tension and release or finding that balance. I think that's a really valuable way of looking at it. You used an expression there I'd love for you to explain a bit more, which was a sound meal. You're providing a sound meal. What does that mean? Well, a sound meal is exactly that. I mean, if you walk into your kitchen and you're preparing a meal, cooking a meal for people, then, you know, you, I don't know, you may have your vegetables or your fish or meat or whatever it might be, but everything is there and you put it all together one way or another and, and you prepare it all and lo and behold, it's, it's there um, on a plate for people to enjoy. And, uh, and that's what we do as musicians. So we have our instrument, we have the tools that we need in order to bring the sound meal together. We have the music, we have the lights, we have the, this, the music stand and uh, our spare reeds or mallets or whatever it is, you know, so all of these things. And we pop them all together and we mix this with that and mix that with that and blah, blah, blah. And then lo and behold, when the time comes, we give the sound meal, the piece of music or if it's an improvisation or whatever it is, but we give this sound meal to our customers. And uh, and then we just allow them to digest this meal in any way that they would like, you know. So some people sitting up in the balcony may have a fantastic view of everything on stage, um, but not necessarily um, such a good oral experience than the people sitting, let's say, in the stalls or something. I don't know. So we can't assume that everybody is digesting that meal in the same way. Um, and I think with music, of course, we have so many different mediums of digesting the meal. Sometimes it's without the visual aid. So sometimes it's just orally. Um, sometimes we feel really satisfied when we have that oral experience and the visual experience. Um, sometimes we it's even more enhanced if we're sitting in the front row as opposed to, you know, right at the back and we're kind of, ooh, ooh, you know, who's that playing bassoon or something? And uh, so we, we've got to think about that too. Um, but but yeah, that's that's what I mean by, by a sound meal. <laughs> Terrific. And that touches on a couple of things I was looking forward to talking with you about. And, and the first of those is what you just described there, which is that you can listen with your eyes, as it were. I've heard you explain this a few different ways, and I think it's something we often overlook as musicians. You know, we think, you know, what will I wear for the gig, maybe, but we don't really consider how important that visual sense is. And I was reminded of this a, a few minutes ago when you were talking about seeing a tractor on a farm, and you, you know, there's a, a visual connection to the sound, and you can have one without the other and still know what's going on. I wonder if you could talk a bit more about this aspect of the visual information that affects our experience of music and maybe how we should be thinking about that as musicians. Well, I think that um, an audience member knows when they're given, given something really honest. Um, and so that isn't about a good performance, a bad performance. I'm not talking about that. I mean an honest performance. And, uh, and that's a feeling, really, and you can feel that when you see the person. Um, and it's not necessarily about what is being worn, you know, as, as they're playing. It, it can just simply be presence, and presence is a form of listening. So that musician, you know, on that platform or wherever they may be, is very much listening to the audience. Now, the audience may not be making any kind of sound at all. It's the presence of the audience 
And we all know that when there's the presence of the audience there and their participation, you know, as receivers of the sound, actually that something to us as musicians as far as our interpretation is concerned. And it almost becomes as though we're walking on this tightrope um, because the nerves are kicking in and we want to do our best and you know we're sort of concerned about all sorts of other things. Will we forget a piece of music if it's not an improvisation? But you know, all sorts of things can kick in that can just sort of you know make us wobble on that tightrope. Um, but actually when we do appreciate the audience being there, their presence, it's it's then it opens up the experience as though we're all sharing this piece of music together. We're all discovering this piece of music together. And and that's really important. So it isn't a case of them and us, you know, or them and me, or whatever the situation is. It's it's really no, here we are, we are all digesting this sound meal together. And uh and I think that can really make a, a, a difference to how we connect physically with our audiences and how then true that performance actually is. Um, because you can then allow to take chances. You can allow to, to still keep asking questions during the performance, not just during a practice period or a rehearsal period, but during a performance. Keep asking questions. And yes, it may mean that you go, Whoop! that didn't work but anyway you know the fact is that you've put yourself in that situation um and and when you make that a kind of um oh what can i say almost like an attitude in a way the risks that you take become so exciting you know they become really it, it's like being on fire it it's it people want to 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 be part of that really you know they want to feel as though what's going to happen next what, what what now you know rather than ah yeah i know this piece of music and yeah yeah you know i heard it before and other but it's no you've never heard this piece of music with this person before so every time we play it's as though we're given a world premiere even if we've played a piece a million times before we have not played it in front of this audience therefore it's a world premiere Tremendous. And I think you touched there on the other aspect of a sound meal that I wanted to dig into, which is it's easy to say, play it musically or play it with expression or, you know, try and get the audience on board. What does that mean in practical terms? I love the way you talked about it earlier in our conversation in terms of the different kind of dimensions of music you could explore for making it happy or making it sad, doing more than just playing with the timing or playing the correct notes. How do you think about this? If you sit down to prepare a new piece, how do you think about how will I shape this musically? Um, I guess I'm curious in advance of the performance and also in the moment when you're trying to kind of make that connection with your listener. I'm not sure, actually, because I think it just sort of depends on the situation. I, I find that as a percussion player, so thinking about myself as an instrumentalist, um, I'm thinking about the practicalities um, of the piece of music. Um, this may not be something that a violinist or a wind player or uh, even a pianist has to think about. As a percussion player, if it's for multi-instruments, you have to think, practically you know how how do you think this might be set up so where would you like the snare drum to be where would you like the marimba to be where would you like that symbol to be and so on so and those are things that you will not set yourself or decide upon straight away that will take a, that i mean that can happen over a, a, a long period of time it can even change during you know or after the first performance i mean i actually remember giving the premiere of the christopher rice percussion concerto and we had four consecutive nights of that piece of music and uh and every single night i changed the setup because it was just ah what would happen if i placed the steel pan over there or what would happen if i placed the grillos over there or something so i had that opportunity to do that um so but then really when i look at a piece of music it's like reading a book 
so you look at the shape of the piece, you look at the, the, the climaxes of the piece, you just look at the story of the piece, knowing that that story will change as well. So that story, you know, you, you might be given certain words of that story, but all of the filling in of the words, you know, that really make the story, that will happen over a course of time and several, several performances. So, um, and then I'll begin to simply read through the piece. Um, some of it I may be able to read through better than other other places in the piece. Some might be sort of really awkward, but then I'll be thinking, okay, so that section I'm definitely going to have to um, look at from a percussion point of view, um, or that bit, mm, I've just got no idea what I'm going to do with that yet musically, and so on. And it's it's not trying to force anything. I think for me, whenever I learn a piece of music, it has to be a really natural state that you're in. Um, I have to say that it's not always possible to be in that frame of mind because sometimes you get pieces very last minute, you have very little time to, to learn them, in which case you are basically, you know, in sixth gear and you've all of a sudden got to be a Michael Schumacher having never, you know, gone into a Formula One car or something. And you know that, right, I've got to read this really quickly. I have got to make decisions on this really, really quickly. Um, but again, you know that they can change over um, the course of the performances. So it's a kind of different state of mind sometimes. But ideally, it's making sure everything is natural to the way that you work. And again, we're all different. You know, Some people like to put the, the piece of music on their music stand immediately to get it and start reading it. Some people, like myself, like to sort of read it like a book without any instruments um, and then think, OK, what would happen if I did this and that? And then read through it, and but with no expectations, no mad analysis on it, just sort of let it let it kind of just try it on, as it were, you know, try it on and then see what, what needs adjusting. So you're almost like a dressmaker. Great. And you said something there which was... What would happen if this? What would happen if that? If we imagine someone in the position where they've practiced to the point that they can play each note at the right time, on the right pitch, with the right instrument, but they're feeling like this just isn't working, or I, I'm not sure, I, I don't really feel like a musician, I'm feeling a bit kind of robotic and rigid. Do you have any advice for how they can change their mindset or do anything practical to tap more into that creative, curious spirit you were talking about earlier? Well, I, I quite like to, um, I suppose, play, play games. Um, and, and most of those games are pushing your boundaries as regards to the technical aspects or the physical aspect of playing and what you can do, um, as well as the, the sort of sound world that we're dealing with. So, for example, if I feel I'm getting just a bit sort of samey with something or a bit whatever it is, it's it's just it's it's not exciting or or something isn't quite working, then I could change the sticking completely and I could just sort of decide, right, I'm only going to do that with the left hand now. And I know it's ridiculous, but who cares? And it really then mixes things up for you physically and it hauls tools out of your system that you didn't know you had. And you think, oh, now what would happen if I did that on, let's say, a pair of cymbals um, or on a drum kit? Oh, that's, that's quite interesting. And before you know it, you're exploring techniques and ideas on other instruments that you wouldn't have otherwise had, had even thought about. So, and that goes back again to the days of my school school time, whereby, you know, taking bits of um, piano repertoire and flute and so on onto a tambourine, onto a cymbal, onto a bass drum. So, I feel that 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 really keeps me sort of buoyant in a way. Or, for example, um, for years I've played Steve Reich's clapping music, um, which is normally for two players, um, but where I play it by myself playing both parts with my hands using four mallets. So it seems as though it's then four people actually clapping. And, and then I sort of keep cross time with my left foot. And I thought to myself, I've done this for such a long time. Now I'm going to do it with both my feet 
this time. So do the, the clapping part but with my feet and then do other rhythms with my hands. So of course, at the moment, it's like a car crash. You know, I, I, I'm, I can't do it yet, but the fun I'm having in doing it and it's sort of making me realize you know, the, the sort of stronger parts of my body, the weaker parts of my body, and, you know, where things need to be sort of lining up and so on. And that that really, you know, again, it just, it's totally out of my comfort zone. I don't have to do this. You know, there's no mad reason for me to do it. It's not for an exam or anything like that or for a concert. It's just simply because I want to, to sort of be curious to think, well, can I actually do this? So I think this this sort of boils down to your own imagination and how you're willing to to really push that imagination you know or just peel that extra layer from the onion to see what's underneath or just sort of open that door and think oh what's through that door it's literally the, like that turning the next page thinking ah what's the next chapter um but that's really down to the person to to be curious to to, to follow that through. I love that. I, um, I'll i confess I'm someone who never really felt creative in music. You know, I come from a very traditional play the notes on the page kind of background. And so I'm always looking for ways to kind of trick myself into being a bit more curious, a bit more exploratory. And I love that idea of just treating it as a game, see how you can push your boundaries. And I know a lot of people watching or listening are going to find that really useful. Well, and I think another thing that I sometimes do is um, is if you're set in a particular tempo with a piece of music, you know, and, and that's where you need to be with it and, and that's what it says on the piece of music or whatever it is, um, you can really say to yourself, well, you know, today I'm actually going to play this as though uh, I'm at a funeral or something and the, the tempo is ridiculously slow, I mean, absurdly slow, but what does it feel like? What happens to your body physically? What kind of ways do you then play your instrument? How do you sustain those phrases when it's so, so slow? What happens dynamically to you? It's the same piece of music, but only the tempo that's changed, but a lot more other things will have changed as well. And it's really taking note of those things. And that's all about listening, you know. So it's not just listening to the sound, but it's listening to the whole picture of how you operate, you know. What is the engine, the body actually doing? And where are the bits that need oiling and that kind of thing? So that, that for me is important. Or doing it vice versa, if you're playing a really slow piece of music, but absolutely, you know, upping that tempo so that it's ridiculously fast. And that may trigger off some compositional ideas. It may sort of highlight things that, oh my gosh, you know, this finger needs a lot more attention. I hadn't realized that before. Or, you know what I mean? Just things physically that um, might feel a bit uncomfortable. Or you might say, wow, that was a lot easier than I thought. And I, I really quite enjoyed that. And, you know, it's, it's things that you can also share with other people too. So it doesn't have to be done in isolation. Very cool. And I, I think what's clear is that this isn't, again, like we were talking about, this isn't just let's be creative and have fun for the sake of it. Clearly, these kinds of exercises are both nurturing your creativity and pushing you to a new level in terms of technique and proficiency. Yes, it is. And I think also it, it um, gives you a slight sense of empowerment as well. And I mean, I don't mean that in an egotistical way. I simply mean it gives you that um, feeling that you can, you are allowed to do this, you are allowed to uh, to explore, you know, you are an explorer of sound, that's, that's what being a musician is. We all deal with sound and we are basically presenting the sound world to our customers. So it doesn't matter which instrument you're playing or whatever it is, we all have the same kind of playing field in a way. We have a tool and imagination. That's what we've got. Those are the two ingredients that we all have if we're embarking on this sort of thing. So it's just then how you, you want to deal with those things. Tremendous. Well, I, I think we've kind of touched on it from a few different angles, but I do want to ask you the direct question, which is 
I guess two questions. <laughs> the first is, what does listening have to do with musicality? If we have a musician who wants to feel more musical, how does listening factor into that? And the second, more broadly, your mission is to teach the world to listen. What does that mean to a non-musician or what does what's the significance of listening beyond this kind of world of performance that we've been talking about? Mm. Well, the, the, the whole, I mean, we, we imagine that musicians listen really well and we listen in a type of way, I suppose, or we can be kind of led down that tunnel um, and we are quite critical listeners of what we do, we're quite critical listeners of what other people do too, but at the same time we can be extremely selfish listeners and the kind of listening that we do as musicians needs time out. So we need almost that time to not listen to yet more music and that can sometimes be overload and we sort of forget to listen to ourselves. And so listening to ourselves, not as musicians, but as, well, how am I feeling today? You know, or what's going through my mind today? And how could that actually affect then what we do as musicians? So I think I, I found in my own situation that um, I went through, I think around about when I reached the age of 40 or something where the diary was so overloaded with concerts and things that I got to the point where the last thing I wanted to do was to play. It was just too much, basically. It was too much playing, too much listening of the same kind of thing. And I found that I just needed to back off. So I simply weeded the diary out. And from that point on, it's it's been a case of really thinking about the projects you want to be involved with and why you want to be involved with them and that's really helped my listening actually so that there's not this overload that's going on there's not this feeling where you're just going from one to the next to the next to the next to the next and i think that's really important so we all have our own um uh schedule or time schedule of, of how we operate. Some people like a lot in the diary, some people like much less, some people are much more middle ground. It's entirely up to the individual. But it is important to really listen to this to yourself. It's almost like putting on, you know, in in, in um in aeroplanes where they ask you to put on your, your own mask first before you can help someone else. And I always remember in the early days thinking, well, that's ridiculous. You need to help other people first before you put your own on. But actually, of course, you need to put your own on first so that you're in a good state to help someone else. And it's the same with listening. You've got to have this engine operating really well before you can then listen further to what, what needs to happen. So that's important. And I think that, again, listening for me is... It's about being present. It's about focus. It's about concentration. It's, can you imagine us having a conversation? Now we're doing this by Skype, but we're still listening to each other. But wouldn't it be a very different scenario if I was on my phone, you know, texting and, you know, I was sort of seeing if the lunch van was coming or what's going on? <laughs> or whatever, you know, and uh, oh yes, Christopher, yeah, and, yeah, that's, that's really nice, yeah, mm, yeah, it's a to it would be a totally different experience, but being present and wanting to be present and for that p other person to feel the presence, I think, is so crucial, and even more so as we are all busy texting and emailing and all of that kind of thing. The beauty about music and creating music is that you're experiencing it with other people. You really are. So even in the privacy of your own four roles, I suppose it's the difference between rehearsing and practice. For a lot of us, we think, oh gosh, we're in this room, so we're practicing, we're practicing, we're practicing, and then we're leaping to a performance. But actually, if 
in those four walls, you think, no, I'm rehearsing. So even if you're playing a scale, you're rehearsing. So you've got the audience there, or you've got the scenario that you want. And you imagine yourself being in a cathedral where the acoustics are so wet, you know, or in a dry studio or somewhere, you know, you're imagining yourself in a different environment than the four walls. Then your sense of projection and the decisions that you make as a musician all change. So that's all about listening. It really is. So it isn't just about the piece of music that you're playing. Are you playing right notes, wrong notes? Is the rhythm right? Is it wrong? Whatever it is, it goes beyond that. It really does. It's this. It's it's giving. It, it's yeah. It's a presence. That that's what listening is. Lovely. Well, I was saying to you just before we hit record how inspiring I found your work, and we'll certainly be linking in the show notes to some of your essays and videos and presentations so that people can learn a lot more about your mission. Um, all I just wanted to say a big thank you. You, despite that weeding of the calendar, you are a lady who manages to tackle a lot of really fascinating projects. So I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us on the show. And also to ask, what's coming up next for Evelyn Glenny? What's the, the future holding? Oh, heavens. Um, I think it's really a time of, I suppose, thinking outside of the box. Um, a lot of the projects that I'm involved with are projects that I did not have on my hit list, as it were. So, um, for example, uh, last year I wrote my first ever theatre uh, score, and that was for the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, for the play Troilus and Cressida. And that was hugely exciting, and again, quite um, quite scary to do, but that in, in a good way. Um, so I very much enjoyed that. And, uh, and at the moment, we're, well, I'm preparing a new percussion concerto to be played in Turkey in February. And uh, so um, that will be going through the motions of what we talked about um, in this particular podcast. Um, and, you know, it's just, a, it's just a wonderful kind of way or a wonderful profession, I should say, whereby you never quite know what's going to happen you think you have everything planned out and then whoosh off you go in another direction and and that's a really healthy thing to do and i think the older you become the more important that is to do wonderful well i i highly encourage people to check out evelyn.co.uk which is your main website and we'll have links in the show notes very big thank you evelyn for joining us today thank you very much thank you <laughs> oh hey one more thing if you enjoyed this video, please take a second to like it on YouTube, and if you haven't already, please also subscribe to our channel there. That's going to help make sure you get all our latest videos as soon as they come out, and it also helps us reach more people, which means more episodes, better guests, and everybody wins. So please take a second to like this video and hit subscribe.